So uh, this is really going to be fun. We are here to talk about the latest episode of Star Trek Discovery. Uh, this is called The Context is for Kings. And this is episode three, technically. Uh, it's, it kind of feels like episode two after the premiere, two-part premiere. And uh, yeah, my friend Tom is here to talk about it. Hi, everybody. Yeah. And so this is going to be really interesting because it seems like I had a very different response than most everybody else that I'm reading and hearing from. So I'm very curious to talk to you about it. But basically in this episode, we get to find out what happened next after uh, the uh, after uh, Burnham is uh, Michael Burnham is uh, court martialed basically and we kind of go from there so we'll talk more about that uh, but what was your base kind of response to this episode um boy um yeah it was kind of all over the map um it's loaded with fan service it's um darker than most most star trek we've seen uh it's um and yet there's also some really wonderfully bright points in it that are very bright and shine real bright mm. um and uh Boy, yeah, it's quite a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, well, that's good to hear. It's not like I hated it. I just was kind of disappointed because for me, I felt like it was something really special in the premiere to have these, uh, particularly have these two female characters that were, you know, diverse, that had presence. And to me, I'm, I'm no expert on Star Trek, but just from my limited experience, what makes Star Trek special is you have characters with differing ideas kind of battling it out. Uh -huh. You know, whether it's Wrath of Khan or, or uh, the, you know, the Voyage Home or, or these things, you have these sort of different philosophies of like how to explore and how to rule and how to, uh, how to bring peace. And, you know, what, like whether it's Spock or, and Kirk or uh, Kirk and Khan or, or a million different team ups kind of with different philosophies. And I, mm -hmm. I liked that about the premiere that you had the captain with a philosophy about not engaging. And then you had uh, Burnham with this philosophy of we've got to kind of beat them at the punch sort of philosophy. Yeah. And you had them battling back and forth. And to me, that was really cool. And I thought that that seemed like Star Trek, but then I heard so many people say, Oh, this doesn't feel like Star Trek. It's not Star Trek. And, uh, and to me, I felt like this episode, uh, it kind of, took these what were strong characters for me obviously the the captain has died but uh it took a strong character and uh, or an interesting character that we ha that i haven't seen before uh, on the show as much uh but or on the movies at least and kind of made her sub i'm not gonna say subservient because that's too strong but but you had two white men kind of telling her what to do and that wasn't as interesting to me as what it was happening in the premiere and so that's why i felt like it was a little bit disappointing and felt kind of generic to me uh, and uh, compared to what had been seemed special in the premiere that's interesting okay um yeah no i see your point um i as you were talking i was thinking about how you, you were you were saying how much you like captain giorgio and um i liked her a lot too yeah but i think that the where I'm landing on her with her is that it, um, she's kind of this series Captain Pike. Mm. Uh, you know, the original series had uh, two pilots. Um, it had a pilot uh, where it had a, a mainly different cast, or, uh, except for, you know, Leonard Nimoy as Spock. He was the only carryover yeah. uh, when the show resumed. And in the, that first pilot, um, Captain Pike, not Captain Kirk, was in charge of the Enterprise. That's where the character comes from in the movies. Um, and in that episode, you know, we sort of see a certain way of doing things. Um, and um, he's sort of um, a present in, he's sort of a, a presence in the, in the show going forward. In a similar way, I think you've got Captain Giorgio being the one to kind of kick things off, but don't get used to her. Right. So I, I think that's interesting there. But also I like the, I, it was interesting the way she comes up a lot and the way that she's remembered. Mm-hmm. And um, the way that um, I think she represents the way things were before Burnham made her terrible decision. Yeah. And the way Starfleet was before Burnham made her terrible decision. I, I was really intrigued to see a little bit of 
the penal system of the 23rd century because um, that's something that Star Trek has touched on in the past um, in various ways. And I'm, it's in, an, an intriguing idea because there's two different approaches. There's either the future is more enlightened and we're taking better care of people and we're helping people actually rehabilitate mm-hmm. or we're just throwing them away like we always have. Um, and basically considering them human garbage and we're just keeping this, you know, it's a, it's a landfill for humans. That's Mm -hmm. kind of how our, in my opinion, that's how our prison system currently operates. And, Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of, you saw a little bit of that in undiscovered country, you know, when, right. right. Of course that's, that's a Klingon prison system, right? Oh, right. Uh, Okay. So that's, that's not a federation prison that the federation, the federation prison system would be very, very different. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. So that yeah, the Klingon prison system is that's basically a concentration camp, right? Mm. But um, I don't think that's the kind of conditions that uh, right, right, that Burnham's okay. finding herself in. But um, yeah, there is a sense of like wanting to rehabilitate. There was a there was a character in Voyager um, who broke the law somehow. It's never we're never really all that clear on what he, exactly what he did, but he he did something real bad. And ended up in a, a, feder- a federation penal colony in New Zealand, and it looks pretty pleasant. There was no guard towers, there were no um, mm. armed guards. Uh, you know, he was working, and he was in kind of a, a bland-looking uniform, but uh, he wasn't suffering. You know, bored maybe was the the worst you could say of his experience. Boring. Um, okay. So yeah, there, 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 there's different people who have handled Star Trek of looked at the the penal system of the future in different ways. And so that, that little taste of it was interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I was a little disappointed because I, it didn't get in. It didn't give me much more detail. Mm-hmm. It, well, from what we saw, it could have been either. It could have been either they're throwing people away, which it kind of looked that way, or it could be, you no, know, they're, 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 people are being re- rehabilitated and are brought back into society. The fact that Burnham is in prison for life is a little troubling in, the, in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wish they almost wish they'd shown a little bit more of like the trial, or uh, been, it would be interesting to know if she, uh, if, if what kind of defense, I don't know, if she had, or I guess if she just said she just said she, she was no guilty, defense. right? She pled guilty, yeah. yeah guilty, yeah, guilty. guilty, yeah. Um, so I don't know. It was, it was interesting. So, um, yeah, this episode it was actually written by Akiva Goldsman, who. Uh, in a oh, lot of uh, nerd culture, is kind of a has a bad name because mm-hmm. he wrote Batman and Robin and uh, Batman Forever, which a lot of people don't like. Uh, but he actually has written some pretty good stuff. He's he's Academy Award winner for A Beautiful Mind, and right. he wrote The Cinderella Man, a bunch of stuff for uh, Ron Howard, and he's done a lot. He's like the rewrite king. He comes in mm-hmm. and uh, and kind of last sort of last minute like does uh does rewrites of uh various films and uh so i i think that uh you can tell that this was professionally written i think the dialogue was pretty good i thought the characters were pretty well written as far as um i don't know i just liked their unique personalities between all of them and uh so i think he did a pretty good job uh, yeah, it might have been nice to have. They did kind of go over the whole uh, imprisonment thing pretty quickly, and then moved on to uh, the various machinations within the ship. Right, to um, just get her on the crew and get her going. Yeah. Yeah, and so what did you think of uh, Captain Lorca? I don't know what to make of him. Um, I I got a bad feeling about him, but one of the themes in Star Trek that um, we're, we've seen in this episode and that I think we'll see again is um, things are not being what they seem. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm sort of reserving judgment on him. I, 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 one thing I think is clear, he's probably not the heroic Starfleet captain we're used to seeing. He's probably more in the vein of the um, amoral Starfleet admiral who has lost his way and is uh, taking everyone down a bad path, maybe more in the the mold of like 
um, Admiral Marcus in Star Trek in the Darkness or mm, mm-hmm. yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, that's a good comparison, actually. Uh, I He seemed more almost more like a general than a captain. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's a soldier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that Jason Isaacs is, is good in the lead. I mean, in the part. And uh, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. Uh, and I guess he described his character. He says he's probably more effed up than any of the previous Star Trek captains. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that uh, plays out. Uh, he, uh, he's obviously un. Um, uh, um, he's obviously does his own thing. I can't think of the word I want to use, but um, uh, he he just to think of using uh, Berman in this way and getting her out of prison, and and so he doesn't play by the book. If that makes sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He's willing to do whatever. Maybe, it yeah, takes. maybe a dark shadow of Kirk, I guess, in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I don't know. It could be could be interesting to see where that goes. Um, he says that uh, that. Let's see here. Yeah, I guess it has a, a southern accent and a cat. It says uh, he wanted to come up with a get her done type catchphrase, which the writers turned down due to it being widely used and copyrighted by Larry the Cable Guy. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. But uh, yeah, I mean, he he wasn't in it too much. His main role it was sort of exposition in this episode, just to sort of explain uh, why he wanted her. And uh, I think we'll get to know more about uh, him in obviously in future episodes. You know, actually, you just reminded me of another um, captain we've seen in Star Trek who very much reminds me of this guy. There was a, an episode of Next Gen where Captain Picard is captured by Cardassians, and um, he he's temporarily replaced. Uh, by a captain who's very different, mm-hmm. and you know, right, and actually, for all they know, for all, as far as they're concerned, Captain Picard is dead. So he he comes on board and takes over, and his style is very different. And instead of making it, make it so, which is what Captain Picard says a lot, he's always saying, "Get it done." So oh. yeah, that's actually that. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> I wonder if, if Jason Isaacs knows of that of that episode, or yeah. <laughs> interesting yeah so then the other main character we got introduced well i guess there were two new characters that got introduced in this episode we had uh anthony rapp as uh as uh is it captain science officer uh, uh paul stamets stamets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so he's over this like big project uh and they bring uh, uh berman on to help with coding Mm-hmm. for this this project and uh, he doesn't like that at all uh, he is very uh, upset that he has to work with her uh, he, he's kind of i didn't feel like he he in this episode at least obviously this is just the first episode but he's just kind of your typical sort of pill you know the guy who's grumpy and angry about everything difficult yeah. Yeah, well, I think he, uh, we we kind of in the shuttle on the way to the the Glen, the Glen, we kind of get from him why he's what you know what stick he's got up his butt. Um, uh, you know, it's really for him. It's all about look. I was a scientist minding my own business, and then Starfleet pulled it all out from under me because you started a war. Thanks, thanks a lot. You know, um, and uh, yeah. he, I don't think he likes being pushed around by soldiers. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And uh, he definitely resents having this criminal on his team, for sure, mm-hmm. and being forced to work with yeah. her. So he didn't like that. And there's this sister ship named the uh, USS Glenn. Mm-hmm. Ship named the USS Glenn. Named and for he, John Glenn. Oh, oh, yeah. I didn't even think First of that. First American in space, yep. That makes sense. Well, so he's been working with the scientists on that ship, uh-huh. And uh, the uh, and there's a conflict with the Klingons, and the ship is destroyed. The USS Glenn, correct? Mm-hmm. Right. And so they end up sending this like group down to to the to the Glenn to find out what's going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they find that it's pretty it's pretty gruesome. 
what they find yeah. that almost reminded me that whole seg- segment almost reminded me of alien more than star trek yeah although it, you'd be surprised how often that kind of thing has happened in star trek um, okay there's a, a an enterprise episode um probably an X-Gen episode at, at least one ds9 episode where it's it, they they go somewhere that's a ship or a station and it's dark and creepy and there's some things jumping out at you um that's kind of a it's actually a trope with the thing is like <laughs> the thing is like with 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 more than 700 hours of star trek existing mm-hmm. you're going to run over some 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 of the same ground sure again. sure sure um but they uh, certainly what was new here was the level of the gruesomeness of the situation mm-hmm. um and actually i uh, while i was you know cringing and looking through my fingers i had to admire the skill and and <laughs> those uh the, what they created, those real sculptures really of these twisted bodies that have been contorted in these, mm-hmm. you know, surreal ways. Yeah. I had to admire that. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if they, since they don't have to worry about uh, network sensors and stuff like that for this, if it is going to be more bloody and more, you know, sort of uh, mature, I guess. Yeah. They, they, they've said that they are going to try to keep it in that, um, like hard PG thirteen realm, mm. and not and not go too too much further than that. So, um, you know, I I trust them on that. But um, yeah, when I, I I've got a five year old son who's who loves the show and is excited to see it. But I I made sure that I previewed it and skipped over when mm. he was watching it that that part of it because uh, a little intense. Sure, sure. And so we also find out that there's some of the Klingons have been kind of slaughtered in this way. So it's not just the humans. And, right, yeah. Apparently yeah. there was a Klingon attack. Or, or Yeah, we don't know how the Klingons got on board. There's Actually, that's another aspect of this that I, we should address is how much mystery there is in this. Mm. Each episode so far seems to just be uh, creating more questions than it answers. Mm-hmm. and well, of course and it, that's a function of this being act one you know yeah but. well a lot of this felt like this was the true pilot and the other was uh i don't know it's just because this had the actual cast and this had yeah. the you know the discoveries there and uh some of the things that it felt almost like the other one was sort of a i don't know like a tv movie or something like that <laughs> right yeah no i did have a tv movie feeling about it you're right yeah. and it, um but i think it um i, I like one thing i like that someone said about the first two was that it was like a cold open mm-hmm. of an episode but extended yeah. um and so, and so yeah that one it was that was the cold open to this story that is this whole season you know? when i guess i was reading that they used the set of the uh was it Sh- shazu or Sh- Shenzo, Shenzo, yeah. Shenzo? sorry and uh they used that set for the Glen, uh, for the uh, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. To, to I thought for sure they again. they were using. I'm sure they used bits of dis- redressed bits of discovery set, discovery set as well. Mm, yeah. And that's a that's an old trick. Um, going back to the original series, mm-hmm. uh, because in the, if you watch the original series, every other Starfleet ship they encounter happens to be the same class as the Enterprise, <laughs> so they can use the same model, the same sets, and it's they just redress it a little bit and it's, you know, it's economical. Right. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what it was, what this, you know, creature is that was after the Klingons and the humans. Like it wasn't just Klingons. There was something else there. So there's no degree a mystery, like you said there. And we also find out that basically uh, commander Lorca like orchestrated everything that led to Burnham being there. Like he wanted uh, her to have the, the problems with her, uh, with her. Yeah. He made her go a particular way. He wanted her to have these problems because he wants her to figure out how they can beat the Klingons. That she sort of started it mm-hmm. with her, like unorthodox. That's the word I was thinking. I was yeah. trying to think unorthodox. He wants her to take her unorthodox thinking and use it so that, to hopefully they'll end the war right and so uh, what, yeah what's interesting is um the way that burnham's decision set all of starfleet on this course like i i i I've mm. some fan, i've read some fans complaining about oh this felt dark this didn't feel like the starfleet i want to join this felt like 
this really dark Starfleet that was no fun and that, you know, that not good. And I think that's on purpose. I think you're supposed to feel uncomfortable yeah. about the Is there at war? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, they're at war, but it, not only that, but like their whole attitude just seems really grim. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm reminded of a, a quote from um, a psychologist named Jordan Peterson. He says, our choices determine the destiny of the world. By making a choice, you alter the structure of reality. And mm. this story kind of exemplifies that, that like before Burnham nerve pinched her captain, they were all living in one world. And after they, everything had changed. Mm. Yeah, and, that's, uh, that's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe it. And you kind of felt that with, uh, with Saru, I think probably sort of the most because he's lived both sides of it. Right. Yeah, that's true. And and actually, I feel like he's a he's a go between. I think he's the one character we see who who knows what they've lost, mm -hmm. and um and, and and knows it thoroughly. Tilly, who I love by the way, uh, Tilly, yeah. is, and we can talk about her. But Tilly is a little naive. She doesn't know what Starfleet she's in, mm -hmm. or if she is, she's mm -hmm. she's kind of hope cringing and hoping it gets better mm -hmm. yeah she's almost like somebody who i don't know how to, but somebody that watch say watches a lot of cooking shows and thinks that then they can therefore cook you know like she's, right. she seems to know all the like fan she almost is like a fan of all right. these things and but she, she thinks she can someday be the captain and someday lead and it's you know it seems sort of hard to believe but she's very cute i i liked her a lot too she uh, ha has a sort of innocence about her uh, a sweetness about her i really i thought she was fun uh addition to the cast because you're right it is kind of without her it's it's cause especially because uh michael burnham is such a sullen character at least right now uh, you definitely need her and there everybody's pretty depressed Seems yeah like. <laughs> yeah she's a ray of sunshine and not yes and, yes, and, and, and to, to some extent it's annoying but in a way that you like yeah. <laughs> in a way that you want to be annoyed right um, uh and she's played by mary weissman is her name mm -hmm. and i really i thought she was really uh really good i liked her a lot as well uh, she, it just gets some like feminine energy in there <laughs> that uh i think it, that is you need you need it you need both sides you need that uh because it's pretty right now it's feeling like a really masculine show uh even though it has this lead female character uh, as far as well, the energy yeah. the energy absolutely and, there's a difference between male and female and masculine and feminine right. those are different right yeah, those are different things exactly so yeah i i think that the i mean i i like the cast I, i'm still not sold on uh i guess anthony rapp his his character we'll see i mean i think he did fine with what he was asked but i don't know just, his character just seemed kind of boring to me uh but you know he's a good actor i i know it's sort of weird because i know him from uh more for broadway he because yeah. he he's uh been in a lot of he was very famous for being in rent for forever mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. he's been in many other broadway shows <laughs> so mm -hmm. i've seen him in a lot of different things than this that's for sure so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I just thought that compared to the first one, which really engaged me, I just found this one to be a little boring, but not, for, I don't know. Maybe I was just expecting something different because it did have good elements, but I was just so surprised to kind of go out of it and me being kind of met on it and everybody, it seemed like everybody else was like, this was so much better. So it really surprised me. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I think we're getting a lot of stuff set up, and you, uh, mm -hmm. we, oh, we met so many characters, and actually, yeah. I'm amazed that we met so many characters and still got so much storytelling done. Yeah, that's fair. It's true, and I guess we have one more member of the cast that we're going to meet next week. Uh, uh, someone named uh, Ash Tyler uh, that says uh, it says on things a Starfleet lieutenant and former prisoner of war. Latif it says do, 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 um, that I guess he has like PTSD issues, and uh, so uh, he oh, I guess he's going to appear next week. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah and it sounds like it, there's some speculation, but it sounds like there's some there's some 
it, like it sounds like Tilly might be on the autistic spectrum or Asperger spectrum. Oh, interesting. Um, because she she talks about having special needs, which is why she had quarters alone. Oh. Um, which actually, now that I, I, I was thinking, their their quarters looked really Spartan, and I maybe that's it. Maybe that's the reason. Mm. Interesting. I can see that. I just figured nobody wanted to bunk with her because she's kind of annoying. <laughs> no, she said she had special needs, which is why she had oh, okay. her own quarters. Yeah. Cool. I didn't, I forgot that. So, all right. Well, I, I think that I'm still excited about the series. So we'll just see where it continues to go. And uh, hopefully they're getting a good enough response with this all access thing. And, uh, that will, yeah, yeah, I hear that it's breaking records in Canada. I don't know. I don't know how it's doing elsewhere. The thing is, like, they don't have to publish you know, yeah. their numbers at all. Yeah. So it's pure speculation. But right. I guess if we keep getting it, we'll know it's doing okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so uh, that's basically everything I had to say about it. Do you have any other points of the show that you want to talk about? The there is just one other thing, and it's sort of yeah. on it. Um, and this has to do with sort of, you know, things you notice if you're a fan. <laughs> so there was some um, commenting about the black badges uh-huh. on the crew on the Discovery. Okay. Um, that black has been kind of a characteristic color for um, Section 31, which if you've, you've seen Star Trek Into Darkness, you've heard of this. Um, so um, it has to do with the Federation Charter, Section 31 in the Federation Charter specifies something along the lines of, the Federation can spy. The Federation can have secret operations to defend the security of, of uh, the Alliance. And um, so it, they're always the baddies. They're, they're always crossing moral and ethical lines. They're kind of like the CIA um, uh, in, you know, uh, techno thrillers. They, you know, they're always the, doing black ops and stuff. And something that was interesting that a fan site pointed out was that the registry of the discovery is NCC 103131. Um, and with all the, yeah, with all the cloak and dagger stuff, it would not surprise me if we find out later that, and that section 31 is deeply involved in whatever this, the discovery is up to. Hmm. Interesting. So I, I foresee, you know, I'm going to, you know, get out my crystal ball. I foresee that what mm-hmm. we're going to see here is a battle for Michael Burnham's soul, her, as she redeems herself, mm-hmm. he's going to try be trying to redeem Starfleet because Starfleet's in a bad way. And I think yeah. That's well, true. the next two episodes sound like they're going to be pretty intense. Uh, we have the butcher's knife cares not for the lamb's cry. Sounds is, cheerful. Is, yeah. Is next episode. And then the one after that is choose your pain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the the titles are are very tricky. Um, that fits <laughs> alongside with whom gods destroy and let that be your last battlefield. And you know, yeah. Um, oh yeah, one more. Oh, sorry, just one more thing. No, please. Um, so um, the con- the title is of this one is context is for kings. Mm-hmm. There's a um, an episode of the original series called the conscience of the king. Mm. Right, that quote from Shake from Hamlet where. Um, you know, the play's the thing that will prick the conscience of the king. Um, and in that episode, uh, a character who would around, uh, around this time period was a tyrant uh, and killed a whole colony, a whole Federation colony, or not, not a whole colony, but decimated a Federation colony because they were starving. Um, he was thought to be dead, but then Kirk finds that he's on the run and masquerading as a as an, as an actor in a, in a Shakespeare troupe on his ship. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's interesting. An interesting connection. And the other thing is like with this, with Star Trek, the the writers are fans. They know their stuff. Don't, you can't, you can't take anything as coincidence. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, they've had uh, the, the um, Roddenberry uh, family, uh, I think is, son has been very involved with this and yeah, he's a producer uh, on the show yeah and i think nicholas meyer has also been a producer or has been involved mm-hmm. uh, so there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of star trek knowledge uh involved in all aspects of this show so yeah i definitely think that that's not by accident for sure so okay that's it that's really it <laughs> oh there's <laughs> Alice in wonderland but we don't I won't get into it 
All right. Uh, so, yeah, and this episode was written by uh, Brian Fuller and, or the story, Brian Fuller, who's, uh, I guess, a big uh, name. He was, in, the, he was the creator of the show. Creator. Yeah. yeah. It was going to be the showrunner, but got canned for delivering scripts late. So, mm, yeah. But didn't he work on Next Generation too? No, Brian he Fuller. was involved with Enterprise. Oh, uh, okay. okay. Voyager, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, what happens with uh, Lorca, with Berman and her new sort of assignment on this ship and how that goes down. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how uh, the, uh, I always forget his name, the Anthony uh, Rapp character, how he deals with this. We've got uh, Saru and sort of getting over his issues uh, with, uh, with Burnham. And uh, you've got this mysterious creature that, you know, killed some of the Klingons and the destruction of the Glen and how that's going to work. How are they going to defeat the Klingons? All these little sort of balls in the air. It's going to be interesting to see how it all goes down. Yes, indeed. Look forward to it. <laughs> so awesome. So where can people find you? Um, I'd love for you to follow my, um, my Twitter feed uh, at Happy Place Poems, um, poem, poetry inspired by Disneyland. If you want to just um, follow my personal stuff and my, you know, random thoughts, I'm at Almano Roboto on Twitter. Awesome. Great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, find me at Smiling LDS Girl on all social media. And uh, my blog is 54 Disney Reviews. And uh, I just posted on my, uh, on iTunes, which you can follow Rachel's reviews on, uh, on iTunes. Uh, yesterday we did a... Uh, podcast me and my friend Patrick on Blade Runner uh, so we will, and I'll be seeing the new film on Thursday so that should be pretty fun and interesting and uh, also uh, I have the next episode of uh, I'll talk about contrast but of the Hallmarkies podcast with my friend Amber we're going to be talking tonight about When Calls the Heart season three and four so we're doing some catch up and so that should be fun so uh variety is the spice of life right <laughs> yeah let it never be said your taste is an eclectic yeah <laughs> that's right so all right well thanks again for joining me and we will talk next week